Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. The part two of the book continues with the detailed narration of the Muslim conquest of North Africa which is also known as the Muslim conquest of the Maghrib. The conquest was led initially by Amr bin Alas and then continued on with Uqba bin Nafi. The conquest of North Africa lasted from 647 AD to 709 AD. Start of chapter 16 War in the Mediterranean the next three years passed uneventfully in Egypt. Africa continued to pay its jizya dutifully, as stipulated in the treaty signed after Subetula, and Abdullah bin Saad continued to administer Egypt with efficiency and zeal. Then he turned his attention to the south, the land of Nubia. The attempt of Amr bin al to subjugate Nubia in 21 Hijri after his first conquest of Alexandria, had proved abortive and his expedition had returned to Egypt with nothing to show for its troubles but a lot of one-eyed men. What little we know of that expedition has been described in chapter 11. Now, ten years later, in 31 Hijri, 651 or 652 AD, Abdullah bin Saad made the second Muslim attempt to bring Nubia under military control. He led an expedition south to Dumkula, on the bank of the Nile, but could not conquer the Nubian capital, nor win a military victory. He too found a large number of one-eyed warriors on his hands, as a result of the superb archery of the Nubians, whom the Muslims grudgingly called the archers of the eye, because they always aimed at the eye and seldom missed their mark. One of those who stopped a Nubian arrow with his eye was Muawiyah bin Hudaj, who would later become governor of Egypt and lead several expeditions into Africa. Since no decision could be achieved, in spite of all the unpleasant fighting, Abdullah bin Saad entered into an agreement with the Nubians to seize operations. It was not a permanent peace treaty, just a pact according to which a. neither side would commit aggression against the other, b. Nubians could pass through Egypt and Muslims could pass through Nubia, but neither would stay in the other's land. C. The Nubians would provide the Muslims with 360 slaves every year. D. The Muslims would supply the Nubians every year with a given quantity of grain. The pact was signed at Tumkula and the Muslims returned to Egypt. The Nubians remained as before, a simple and backward, but a proud and unconquered people. While as an administrator, Abdullah bin Saad had proved very effective and appears to have been especially gifted in financial matters, as a general, he had not shown too brightly. The Muslim campaign in Africa had ended in success, not because of him but in spite of him, and in Nubia the military dividend of his operations had been nil. But strange to tell, at sea he was an altogether different man, vigorous, driving, bold. In all fairness to him, it must be said that while on land he was a lamb, and sometimes a fox, at sea he was a tiger. He was to become the first noted admiral of Islam, and the first to win a major naval victory. But for Muslim operations at sea, we must go back a few years to the time of Caliph Umar. In the last few years of his caliphate, Syria had consisted of three administrative parts, Emesa and Canasarin in the north, Palestine in the south, and Jordan and Damascus in the middle. The governor of the middle part of Syria was Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, an able and ambitious man who was keen to try his hand at naval operations. He wanted to take Cyprus. He wrote to Umar about the project and sought his permission to lead an expedition to Cyprus. 
Umar's aversion to seeing his armies crossing water obstacles has already been mentioned in chapter 9. Moreover, the Muslims had heretofore been land warriors with no experience of naval operations. Umar had no intention of acceding to Muawiyah's request, but decided to get a second opinion, that of Amr bin al-As. Amr did nothing to reassure the Caliph. In fact, he painted a terrible picture of the sea. O commander of the faithful, he wrote, I have seen a numerous people going upon it, overpowered by a few. When it is calm, it tends the heart, and when it is in motion, it twists the brain. It weakens confidence and strengthens doubt. There is nothing there but sky and water. People at sea are like a worm in a log of wood. If their boat inclines, they sink, and if they survive, they are dazed. Upon receiving this letter, Umar wrote to Muawiyah, We have heard that the Syrian sea rises higher than the highest thing on the earth, and that it seeks Allah's permission day and night to spread over the earth and drown it. So how can I send forces over this terrible kafir? By him who sent Muhammad وسلم, with the truth, I shall never send any Muslim upon it. The Muslim is dearer to me than the Roman whale. Beware of asking me again. Muawiyah bided his time. Upon the death of Umar, Usman became caliph. He was a kinsman of Muawiyah. Usman extended Muawiyah's authority by making him governor of all Syria, with the result that Muawiyah became the ruler of the entire western part of the Muslim world, north of Egypt. And Muawiyah kept pastoring Usman for permission to take Cyprus. At last Usman agreed, provided that Muawiyah took his wife with him and used only volunteers for the expedition. Muawiyah first took measures to make his desert soldiers sea-minded. He appointed a man named Abdullah bin Qas as his admiral and launched several small expeditions at sea. We do not know what mission Abdullah was given, but he led 50 expeditions, probably to raid the coast of Asia Minor and attack Roman craft, and he lost not a single man or vessel. On the last of these expeditions, however, a raid against a Roman port, Abdullah bin Qas was killed. The expedition to Cyprus was launched in 28 Hijri, which began on September 25, 648, and was commanded by Muawiyah in person. Though we have no knowledge of the number of ships or men involved, Cyprus was seized without opposition. The Cypriots submitted to the payment of the jizya, 7,000 dinars a year, and the Muslims returned to Syria, leaving Cyprus in peace. What is unusual about the tax transaction is that the Cypriots would pay an equal amount to Constantinople, and this was an open arrangement. Both sides knew what the other was getting, and it was understood that neither would interfere. This was the first major naval expedition in Islam. It does not make an admiral of Muawiyah because there was no naval battle, not even a minor engagement at sea. The honor of fighting the first naval battle of Islam goes to Abdullah bin Saad bin Abi Sar. It took the Romans some time to recover from the defeats suffered by them at the hands of the Muslims in Egypt. Their attempt to regain Egypt in 25 Hijri had got off to a promising start, but thanks to the resumption of command by Amr bin al-As, it ended in failure and disgrace. Two years later, Gregory revolted in Africa, and this, a stab in the back by their own kind, was a very painful loss. It took the empire time to recover, but recover it did, and the naval expeditions launched by Muawiyah, culminating in the capture of Cyprus, drew Roman energies into shipbuilding and maritime operations. The Romans built a large fleet and got down in right earnest to preparing men and equipment for the sea. This led to a sense of naval rivalry and mutual apprehension. The Muslims now understood that with their command of the sea, the Romans could land a large force at any spot on the Syrian, Egyptian 
and African coasts, and the Romans knew that by taking to the sea, the Muslims would pose a direct threat to all imperial lands, even Constantinople. In response to the Roman challenge, Abdullah bin Saad also built a fleet at Alexandria. The initiative taken by Muawiyah in the matter of Cyprus had opened the door to the sea, and Abdullah showed more openness of mind than most Arab military commanders of the time. He had a better grasp of naval potentialities than others did. But the fleet was little more than a means of transportation, as indeed was the Roman fleet, and naval battles in this period of history amounted to nothing more than land forces, fighting a land tide battle at sea, using the ship as a vehicle and platform. The Muslims had their soldiers to do the fighting, and engaged cops to do the rowing and other seaman work. The first naval clash between Rome and Islam took place in 31 Hijri, 651 or 652 AD. It was probably an attempt by the Romans to land troops on the Egyptian coast, but very little is known about this action. Abdullah bin Saad sailed out to meet the Roman fleet, and after some fighting, the Romans were repulsed. The Muslims gained valuable experience from this battle, which was given the name of Asawida. The next major naval action, known as the Tosavari, was fought three years later in 34 Hijri. We have no knowledge of the exact location of the Battle of Savari. We know from Zahabi that it was fought near the coast not far from Alexandria, and he is the only historian who mentions its general location. There is some confusion also about the composition of forces. According to Tabari, Muawiyah himself accompanied the fleet with his army of Syria, marching by land, but other historians have said nothing about the participation of Muawiyah in this battle. It seems unlikely too, because such coordination between military forces of two large provinces of the Muslim state without a central command would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Other versions excluding Muawiyah from this operation are more likely to be correct. The Roman fleet consisted of over 500 vessels, filled with sailors and fighting troops and commanded by Emperor Constance in person. It was the largest fleet that had ever put to sea since the advent of Islam. The Romans sailed across the Mediterranean to make another attempt at Alexandria, with the ultimate aim of recovering their Egyptian empire. But Abdullah bin Saad came to know that the Romans were up to and was ready for action when they came. The Muslim fleet consisted of just over 200 vessels. We do not know the strength of the force embarked on these vessels, but half the force available was placed in the ships and half moved as a land force along the coast, under the command of Busar bin Abi Artah, who was later to become quite a famous sailor. Abdullah bin Saad had disembarked his naval half from the ships, and they were encamped on the coast, with the other half some distance away when warning was received of the approach of the Roman fleet. He got his men embarked quickly, but there was only half strength because Busar bin Abi Artah was elsewhere. However, Abdullah with his force was ready to receive the Roman fleet and if necessary would follow his enemy wherever the enemy went and force an engagement upon him. As the Roman fleet appeared over the horizon, the Muslims were impressed by its size and order but remained eager for battle. The two fleets came closer. Then a strong wind arose and it blew against the Muslims. Because of the wind, the Muslims dropped anchor and the Romans followed suit. The wind stood all night. In the morning, the wind dropped and the two fleets raised anchor. As was the custom of chivalry practiced on land, the Muslims offered to fight the Romans on land or at sea as they wished. The Romans disdained fighting on land and chose the sea, and the battle began. Once the Roman fleet was within bow range, the Muslims opened up and maintained a steady barrage of arrows. It had little effect on the Roman ships which drew closer. Then the arrows were used up and Muslims began to hurl large stones at their adversaries, but this too had no visible effect. 
Then the Roman fleet came right up into physical contact, and the warriors went for each other with sword and dagger. One source describes succinctly how the Roman emperor saw the battle. He kept in the rear, some distance away, for his own safety, and every now and then a messenger would come from the front line in a boat and tell him what was going on. After the start of battle, when the messenger arrived in his boat, Constance asked, What is the enemy doing? They are fighting with bows and arrows, replied the messenger. Then Rome has won, said the emperor. After a little while the messenger made his second trip, and again Constance asked, What is the enemy doing? Their arrows are finished and they are throwing stones at us. Then Rome has won, said the emperor. The messenger went back to observe the battle, and after a while came up again to make his report. Again Constance asked, What is the enemy doing? Their stones are finished, replied the messenger. They have tied their ships together and are fighting with swords. Then Rome has lost, said the emperor. Rome had not lost, not for a long time. In fact, initially it was the Roman fleet which launched the attack and heated up the battle. Both fleets tied their ships together with several ships forming a group, and in some cases there was a tying arrangement for the masts also. This and the fact that everyone was mixed up in a wild melee of ships and sails gave this battle its name, Zatus Savari, the Battle of the Masts. As the Roman fleet attacked, groups of Roman vessels assailed corresponding groups of Muslim ones. It appears that the Muslim formation and frontline organization was not very orderly, and the Romans broke the Muslim line in several places. This led to hard and vicious fighting with men leaping at each other, and using sword and dagger in an orgy of killing, crew assaulting crew, and men assaulting men. This is just the kind of fighting the Muslims loved, because in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the hardy Muslim warriors, veterans of many battles, were superior to their relatively softer opponents. The Romans were slaughtered in huge numbers, but they fought on and for a long time the battle hung in the balance. After a good deal of fighting at close quarters, the Romans accepted defeat. They broke contact and pulled back out of the battle area and sailed away to the north. The Muslims returned to the nearby coast, where they spent several days before marching off to Alexandria and then back to Fustat. It was a great victory for Muslim arms. The faithful had ventured into the sea, which had hitherto been the exclusive province of the Roman Empire, and which held terrors for many of them, who had never taken their feet off firm land. They had taken on the most formidable navy of the time, one more than twice as strong as their own, and beaten it squarely. A very large number of Romans had been killed, and a very large number wounded among those who survived to return home. The Muslims too took heavy casualties in this battle, but even in terms relative to their strength, their casualties were light compared with those of the Romans. There was such ferocity in this battle, and such was its bloody harvest, that the nearby shore became the scene of a horrible spectacle for the next few days. Waves of the ocean lapping the shore carried blood, the blood overspreading the water, and incoming waves threw bodies upon the beach until the beach was covered by human corpses. Not for a long time would the Eastern Roman Empire dispute with the Muslims the command of the Mediterranean in a major naval engagement. The Romans had been beaten as soundly at sea as they had been beaten on land. The Battle of Savari, fought in 34 Hijri, 654 or 655 AD, was a feather in the cap of Abdullah bin Sa'd, an honor fairly won. It was a first, for no Muslim general before him had put on an admiral's hat, figuratively speaking, faced a powerful Roman fleet at sea and decisively defeated that fleet. But it was his last major achievement. He did not have much longer to go. And the year that followed the Battle of the Masts, that is 35 Hijri, 
was a momentous and very sad year for Islam. Most of the year was a period of unrest in the Muslim world. There was discontent in the provinces and widespread grumbling among the people. All this led in the later months of the year to grave civil disorder and rioting in the capital itself. The rioters were not the people of Medina but Muslims from Kufa, Basra and Egypt. And they were not hooligans and looters but normal citizens who demanded the ouster of Caliph Usman, accusing him of incompetence and corruption. The Egyptian Muslims working against Usman at Medina were led by Muhammad, son of the late Caliph Abu Bakr. The violence of the disorder reached its climax on Zulhaj 18, 35 Hijri, May 17, 656, when the venerable and pious 82-year-old Caliph was assassinated by two of the rioters. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr was present with these two men, but did not himself strike a blow. One of the major causes of this tragedy was a person who has been mentioned in the preceding chapter, Marwan bin al hakam the fellow who took 50,000 dinars from the state's share of the spoils of Subatullah and was allowed to get away with it. Some time after that battle, Usman appointed him as his principal advisor or secretary and he began to wield enormous influence in matters of state. He was always there to advise Usman and seldom was his advice beneficial for Islam or for Usman. He was a thoroughly treacherous and evil person with a malevolent Rasputin-like influence over the Caliph, but for whom Usman's rule would not have ended in such internal chaos and his own violent death. Marwan, of course, got away with it, and with a lot more besides. The death of Usman was followed by several days of lawlessness in Medina. There was a complete absence of order and control. Then Ali bin Abi Talib became caliph, and all citizens of Medina came and did obeisance, except for the clan of Usman, that is the Umayyads, and a few chiefs who remained seated on the fence. Ali was the only one of the great companions big enough to accept the burden of the caliphate, knowing that whoever did so would be accused of having a hand in the murder of Usman, knowing also that he could have been the very first caliph of Islam. Soon after taking over as caliph, Ali dismissed Abdullah bin Saad from his post and appointed another man as governor of Egypt. Abdullah left Hustad and went to live at Ascalan in Palestine, and that was the end of his career. It was the end of his life too, because sometime in 36 Hijri, Abdullah died at Ascalan. He had never been a great man, as a Muslim, as a general, or even as a person, and his passing made not the slightest difference to anybody. End of chapter 16